Hi, good morning. This is going to be the third lecture in the series Unified View of Various Constructions in Topology. In the last two, in the first one, we looked at a case which yielded the subspace topology, and in the second lecture, we extended okay, is extension of what we discussed in the first lecture, and that yielded the product topology. Today, we are going to talk about another construction which will yield the quotient topology and if time permits I look at very simple minded example so that you become comfortable with how to look at the quotient map quotient set and open sets in quotients topology etc okay it's a it's not a mere construction but you should have a, a kind of concrete way of looking at such things hopefully you will give but as I said earlier there will be a separate series of lectures on these things and there will be a lot more examples I'll look at for our question spaces later. Anyway, let's get started. Okay. So let us look at the so this is the case two of our first uh, lecture. I have X and Y okay and X is a topological space and I have just a set a theoretic map so what I want to look for is we are looking for the largest topology on Y call it tau ok let us say it tau is a topology tau x is a topology ok so that the map you have from x tau x to y tau is continuous okay as I said earlier okay we can always take the indiscrete topology on y then the function will be continuous but then it has no relevance to the given data x and the topology of x on x and the map of okay so what we want is we want to make it more challenging that means we want on y large number of open sets okay but what is not clear is even though there exists at least one topology on y such so that this function becomes continuous why should there exist a largest topology that's not very clear right because if you take as we did t okay the set of all topologies tau on x on y so that the function f from x tau x to y tau is continuous okay in discrete topology belong to this okay to get the largest topology what you may look for is a union of all topologies in T right so you may like to define the quotient largest topology to get that look for the union but then union of topologies may not be topology then what you look for is the smallest topology which contains okay so let tau naught be the smallest topology containing union tau tau units okay you see that hopefully this should be the correct one <laughs> okay but it's not a very good way of doing but let us look at something okay let us look at the collection okay suppose there is a topology tau on y okay so that f is continuous okay then for any v in y my f inverse v must be in tau x right so is, is that clear this uh, suggests that we look at this collection f inverse v v is in sorry, sorry set of all v subset of y such so that f inverse v is in tau x this is a collection okay if tau is the topology okay then f inverse will be in tau x therefore let's look at all those things we declare okay yes a subset v of y is open if and only if f inverse v is open in x that's it that's what we want to do we want are you following okay so let us call this as collection as something tau okay since we we know that 
Tauvex is a topology that means it's a closed under orbital union and closed under finite intersections. I should expect this collection tau should also be closed under arbitrary union and closed under finite intersections. Therefore, I should expect tau itself is the topology on y. Do you, do you understand what I am saying? Please pause, review, proceed if you want, play it again. So, we expect tau to be a topology. Okay, let us go slowly. So, I want to know whether empty set belongs to tau. That is very clear because empty set belongs to okay, tau x. And what is f inverse empty set? We had already explained f inverse empty set is empty set. Right? Because x belongs to f inverse empty set. If only if fx belongs to empty set. That means there exists no x which belongs to empty f inverse empty set that means f inverse this is empty okay so what does it say it says that what is our collection when when is a subset v of y the empty set is subset of y okay when is this in tau if and only if f inverse of v is in tau tau x now take v equal to phi then f inverse of empty set is phi but phi is in tau x therefore this follows is it clear Okay, second thing, I want to know whether x belong, sorry, y, y belong to tau, yeah, so that means it belong to tau, if only if f inverse of y belong to tau x, right, so this is a question, this is the definition, right, y belong to tau, if only f inverse y, so what is f inverse y, that's a subset of x, therefore, give me an element x in cap, this, when does, x belong to this. So, if x belong to f inverse y, if only if, let's look at our mantra, if only if f x belong to y. But since f is a function from x to y, f x always is in y. So, what does it say? So, okay, every x in capital X, okay, that yeah, x is in f inverse y. That means, x is a subset of f inverse y. But remember, f inverse y is already a subset of x. Therefore, f inverse of y equal to x but x belong to tau x therefore y belong to is it clear and the third this is now by now you should know I already said it so it should be easy suppose vi i and i is a collection and tau I want to know the union vi i belong to tau right okay is that okay? Right. Now, vi belong to tau. For all i, vi belong to tau. What does it imply? That imply f inverse of vi is in tau x. Okay, call it ui. Okay. Now, I want to know the union of f. Okay. So that means I have to check whether union of i and i of v i whether that is in tau x. Right? This belong this belong to tau, you probably have been of union v i must be in tau x. Is it alright? Okay. Now we already know your inverse of union uh, v i, this is v i. Okay. Inverse images behave well with respect to arbitrary union. Therefore, it's union of i and i of f inverse of v i. But this is nothing other than union of i and i u i. But what do I know about u i? U i is are in tau x and tau x is close under arbitrary union. Therefore, this is an element of tau x. That means union union i in i of vi is in tau okay therefore tau is close under arbitrary union intersection is very similar so let us go first v1 v2 then f inverse of v1 v2 
we want to know whether they are in tau whether v1 v2 is in tau this equation okay but what is this this is nothing other than f inverse of v1 intersection f inverse of v2 again because inverse images behave well with respect to arbitrary intersection in particular finite intersection but what do i know about this since v1 is in tau f inverse of v1 is in tau x this also in tau x by tau x is a topology therefore this this intersection this belong to tau x okay that shows v1 intersection v2 is in tau okay so what do you think i have proved i have proved that okay the collection tau where v v is a subset of y and f inverse of v is open in x this is a topology on y okay this is what we have proved okay right very good now i claim okay we make two claims what is what are the claims i make first claim i make is the function you have from x tau x to y tau is continuous that's by very construction how many of you can see that to show this is continuous what i have to do start with any v in tau and then i have to ask whether f inverse of v is in tau x but that is our very definition v is in tau you found only if f inverse of v is in tau x do you follow that therefore f is continuous yeah pause here itself i should have put a pause review proceed i forgot okay pause review proceed second i want to say it's the largest what do i mean by that let tau dash be a topology on y so that the function f from x tau x to y tau dash is continuous then what is that i want to claim i want to claim tau is the largest topology right on uh, on y having this property therefore what should i expect then we should claim tau dash is continuous in tau this is what we want to prove you understand this but that's very easy okay proof is easy let w be in tau dash then i have to prove w is in tau right this is what i have to prove but w is in tau dash and f is continuous as a map from x tau x to y tau dash therefore since by continuity of f f continuity of f as here what are the topologies with tau x and tau dash okay f inverse of w must be in tau x but remember what is the condition for w to be in tau f inverse of w should be in tau x but that's what i proved okay so this proves by very definition definition of tau tau okay this means tau w is in tau so you gave me any w in tau dash i proved w is already in tau that means w dash is in a tau so so what you have shown us sorry t dash is coming in t so what you have proved is tau is the largest topology on y which makes the function f from x tau x to y tau is continuous okay please go through this understand you can see these are all very set theoretic thing very easy okay so i have i found a topology okay so we are arrived at the topology so so let us summarize f is x to y given and tau x on x is given that is okay then there exists a largest topology there is a topology tau on y so that what are the two things happen
so that one f from x tau x to y tau is continuous and two if tau dash is any topology on y so that f from x tau x to y tau dash is continuous then tau dash is continuous tau furthermore we have explicit very concrete description namely tau is set of all v's so that v is a subset of y and the only condition for v this should be is in tau x okay so this is what we have proved so far please concentrate go through once over okay it is always good to do in abstract things so that you will see the pattern now now what we want to do is we want to apply a special case okay a concrete or special case so let x tau x be a topological space right suppose this is an equivalence relation on x okay i don't want to stop to define equivalence relation i hope all of you know that okay right then let us look at for any x in capital x okay let us look at the equivalence class containing x okay and let x this is the notation this be the set of equivalence classes so this is by definition so as i explained in the first lecture there is a very natural map from the set x to the set x this is called the quotient set okay there is a very natural map from x to the quotient set i will call it pi okay sometimes you can call it q for q for or quotient anyway so what is this x goes to its equivalence class pi of x is the equivalence class of x right so uh, what i am now looking for now remember so i have a topology on this namely because i start with the topological space this is just a set set of equivalence classes there is no topology on set on it so what kind of thing i should ask for i should ask for the largest topology on the quotient set okay i should ask for the largest topology on this set which makes pi continuous that's what just now we solved yeah that topology will be called the quotient topology but i will again go slow i will explain two things okay now so what is the quotient topology tau q the largest topology on x the quotient set which makes the this is called the quotient map which makes the quotient map continuous okay so we have very explicit description from based on this so let b be a subset of the quotient set and look for pi inverse of b that will be a subset of x i want it to be open in x yeah so th those of you who have already seen quotient topology the teacher will always start with this definition okay this is the quotient topology by definition now what do you know you have, you have a lot more significant understanding of this namely tau q is not only a topology on the quotient set it's the largest topology such that the natural 
quotient map becomes continuous. So we have a much better understanding of the quotient topology. Right? Okay. But we will uh, look at a few more things. These are the things. Okay. So quotient topology is already defined. That's it. Okay. So before I go further, let us look for what have we done? Subspace topology, product topology, and quotient topology. All instead of defining the topology, what we did was we asked natural questions. There is a natural maps involved. Okay, we wanted some kind of optimal topology, either the largest or the smallest topology, which makes this natural maps continuous. Investigation of that and the existence of such topologies, okay, gave rise to subspace, product, and quotient topology. Please understand. But quotient thing, I always, the students always find it difficult. <laughs> okay. So I would like to just give one small example how to deal with this kind of objects. Okay. With that, I will stop the lecture. Okay. See, when let us give a very general thing. If I have a set X, okay, there are two natural way, ways. Okay natural ways of producing an equivalence class or creating an equivalence relation. What are they? Number one is when a group G acts on that. If when a group acts on X. Then we say x1 is equivalent to x2 if and only if there is an element g in g so that g dot x1 equal to x2. Okay, and what are the equivalence classes? Or orbits. That's what you must have seen in group theory. Those of you who are not very sure about such thing, I suggest to them look at my about 10 or 12 videos on group actions. The first two or three will already give you a very good idea how to work with group actions, why they are very important. Okay, please look at it. Okay. And the second thing, these are the essentially two natural ways, and to the best of my knowledge, almost all equivalence classes which we deal with in mathematics will arise out of this construction. The other one is I have a map here from X to another set Y. Okay, y is also set. Now I can define equivalence relation on x saying x1 is equal to x2 if and only if fx is equal to fx2. This is an equivalence relation. So what are the equivalence classes? The equivalence class of x is set of all x dash and x so that f of x dash is same as f of x. Okay. One usually picturizes this of following. Okay, how to look at the equivalence classes, how to look at them geometrically. So, for example, this is my f, this is my x, okay, and this is my y, and I have a point x here, I have a point y here, and let's look at this is F universe of singleton y. This is called fiber. Notice that if I have x1, x2 here, suppose I have x1, I have x2, what will happen? F of x1 must be, remember x1 belongs to this same as saying fx belongs to the singleton y, that is fx equal to y. Similarly, yes. therefore naturally x1, x2. Okay, so these are the equivalence classes. Okay. And naturally, if it has to be non-empty, I want y to be in f of x. Usually, in such cases, one assumes the function f is on to also. Okay. Therefore, f inverse y is never empty. Therefore, I will get at least one point. Please go through this. Make sure that you understand. These are the two natural ways in which equivalence classes arise.
Okay, all right. Now I want to look at a very specific example. Okay, of a topological space X and equivalence relation and the corresponding quotient set and the quotient space and look at at least some sets in the quotient space which are open or not open some examples with that I will stop okay so my X is going to be R2 with this usual standard topology standard or usual topology if you want matrix topology right now there are two ways of okay uh, the equivalent solution I'm going to say x1 y1 is equivalent to x2 y2 if and only if the x the x coordinates are the same you can check this an equivalent solution right okay now those of you who are very alert you will ask sir just now you said there are very two natural ways of uh, creating equivalence relation on a given set and uh, here does it arise in one of the methods you understand the question yeah yes you can see that see for example let us look at f from r2 to r such so that f of x y equal to x then what is so when uh, when when you say x1 x2 x1 y1 is equivalent to x2 y2 you put only if f of x1 y1 equal to f of x2 y2 which is if only if x is equal to x2 do you understand this <laughs> right okay in fact it also arises let g r with additive addition this additive group of reals so this acts on r2 okay so let us start with an element t in g then t acts on an element x y in r2 via the action this action this is x plus t comma y do you understand this this is an action okay check this is an action group action now you give me x1 y1 and x2 y2 when are they equal equivalent under the group action they are equivalent if and only if there exists a t in r so that t dot x1 y1 equal to x2 y2 yeah maybe sorry i'll write y plus t okay <laughs> you will see why i want this So what does that mean? That means, okay, you understand this? But this is what this means. There is a t in R, so that t dot x1 y1 is x1 plus y1 plus t is same as x2 y2. You understand that? What does that mean? These two must be equal. This happens if only if x1 equal to x2. Are you following? why because if you x1 equal to x1 y1 and if you give me x1 y2 okay what do i want i want a t y1 plus t to be equal to y2 that means t i can choose y2 minus y1 right therefore t dot this t for this t t dot x1 y1 will be this you understand therefore what i have shown is this equivalence relation comes out of both the constructions via functions as well as via group action okay I'm sure it will be overwhelming for many of you because these kinds of things they are never rarely taught so please please go through let me just check whether it's a recording okay good okay so now come back now given a point a comma b in r2 that's a point p which is a comma b in r2 what is the equivalence classes this is this means set of all x y in r2 so that 
xy is equal to a v. But when does this happen? If and only set up all x y in R2 so that x equal to a. This means it's set up all a comma y in R2 and y is arbitrary. So are you following me? Therefore the equivalence class is the line L A, the vertical line set up all okay the vertical line x equal to a this is set up all x comma y in r2 so that x equal to a so in the if you want me to draw a picture okay let me draw a picture and this is my point a this is the vertical line <laughs> Yeah, are you following? Therefore, the equivalence classes are nothing other than vertical lines parallel to the y-axis. Okay, please pause, review, proceed. So I can think of R two model. This is set of L A A in R. This is what are they? Vertical line X equal to A. So the quotient said I should think of what simply as vertical lines. You understand? How to think of a quotient set now? This particular quotient set, I should think of them as only as vertical lines. So let us just do that. Okay. So these are the various so this is one I'm sorry it may not look <laughs> parallel to the thing but I'm sure all of you understand what it is okay so these are the various these are the elements of the quotient set yeah remember any element in the quotient set must be not a single point it's a ver complete vertical line okay. these are the point so these are the points of this quotient set have you understood now very good just to make sure that you understand let's look at a very simple minded example let us look at the unit circle only circle okay I'm looking at the set C which is set of all x y in R2 so that x squared plus y squared equal to 1 this is also R2 right now tell me what should be pi of c? Remember pi is a map from where to where? R2 to R2 modulo this the quotient set. What are the quotient set? Therefore, this must be some subset of a subset of vertical lines. So I want to know what it is. How will you go through it? All of you should know. So this is a subset, okay. Now suppose take this point one comma zero, right? Now pi pi of that one comma zero should be the entire line x equal to one, and take this point, okay. Suppose x not y not, and pi of this will be the entire line x equal to x not. Therefore, this line should be there, and take this point. This is zero comma one. Therefore x equal to 0 this entire line should be there and similarly the, take this point the entire line should be there and take this point this line x equal to minus 1 should be there do you understand therefore pi of c consists of all vertical lines and uh, of the form lc where minus one let the equal to c let the equal to one. Do you understand this? Please pause, review, proceed. Yeah. Now let me ask you a question. <coughs> Just to make sure that to understand, let us look at one more 
exercise. Let us look at this. This is P equal to A B and this is P P of R. Okay. So let B equal to B P of R. That is the entire thing. Open and the open. This is open. Okay. The boundary is not included. So this is supposed to be open. Okay. So what should be pi of b? If you go through the analysis, you will find. See, let's look at here again the same thing. I have to look at. Look at this. This will be a plus r comma z whatever a comma b, and this will be a minus r b. Do you understand? This is the maximum the x coordinate can vary. Do you follow that? If x y belong to b p of r. Then my x should lie between a minus r and a plus r. How many of you understand this? Right? Therefore, if I take any point here, okay, and the entire vertical line should be there, that means that will be given by Lx, but that x must be between the open and in the open interval a minus r to a plus r. Do you understand that? Therefore, this is set of vertical lines lc where a minus r less than c less than a plus r yeah please pa pause review proceed now this allows me to ask the next question okay let us look at this third. Okay. All vertical lines. Okay. Okay. My set A. Okay. This is a set B, which is a set of a quotient thing. Therefore, B consists of all of all vertical lines. L C where C is greater than equal to zero. Okay, remember this, 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 these are all wrong. I should not have drawn them. I should go here. So let me just redraw. Therefore, it is like this. This line, this line, and this line is also included. Okay. All lines where c is greater than equal to c. Now I want to know. Remember the quotient set has only vertical lines. You should not think of them as a half plane to the right of the y-axis. Please, please, okay. Learn to think. Okay. Any point of the quotient set is only a vertical line. Okay. Therefore, our points are only vertical lines here. Right. Now I want to know whether this is open. <coughs> the quotient topology. How do I answer? I only have to look at what is pi inverse of b. And that is open if and only if this is open. Where? In R2. That's how we define the quotient topology. But what is pi inverse of b? No. That is take all points, take any point x comma y here. Okay, that is a uh, so maybe I should write as a a comma b, and therefore look at this line L a, right? So what is the inverse image of L a? It will be L a, okay? So pi inverse of b. If you had gone through my last two exams, you will see it must be a subset of R2. It is set of x, y. The only condition x is greater than or equal to 0. Right? Start with any x, y where x is greater than or equal to 0. What is pi of x, y? That will be a vertical line. Yeah. Right? Take any point here. A, B. 
and what is pi of a b it is l of a and a is greater than or equal to 0 because here it is therefore this belong to v do you understand that okay so pi of v is nothing other than this and is this open this is not open in r2 therefore we conclude v is not open in where the quotient thing but is it closed What do you think the answer is? To show it's closed is same as saying it's complement is open in R2. Yeah? But what is the complement? Now all of you know, right? All of you should be very adept in these kinds of things. Complement is going to be all the vertical lines. here with x less than 0 ok so r2 quotient minus b is set of lines lc where c is less than 0 that's it because remember r2 the quotient set consists of only vertical line all the vertical lines with lc so that c greater than equal to 0 are in b therefore it's commonly in b all vertical lines lc where c is less than 0 and so call this as u or w and what is pi inverse of w pi inverse of w is all the points x y in r2 so that x is less than 0 this is an open set therefore this is open therefore v is closed in quotient topology okay and one more example with that I will stop this is the last example let x equal to z with a discrete topology right now define okay m is equivalent to n if on loop pi divides m minus n okay therefore you know equivalence classes are congruence classes So, how many congruent classes are there? There are only four congruent classes. Yeah, I hope all of you know from your number theory or group theory. Okay, these are the only congruent classes. Right? So, my set, this is consisting of only these elements. okay again you can ask whether this equivalence relation follows from the same pattern i gave you only there are two methods okay i uh, i think it will be a good exercise for you to figure it out okay both the methods are okay it, this equivalence relation will arise out of a function or it can arise out of a group action also okay the a group which has to act is the subgroup 5z acts on the group z okay yeah, if you have gone, gone through your group theory, you should know all these things. But anyway, let's not worry about. Okay, right. So what are this? So if you give an n by, I know that n can be written as some q times 5 plus r, where 0 less than r less than 5. This is a unique expression. Therefore, I have f from z to, okay, 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 4, namely, give me any n map it to the unique r because this is unique therefore this is a well defined function and f inverse of r is precisely your thing okay so your equivalence relation is given by this f and 5z pause review proceed make sure that you understand 5z acts on z how does it act okay give me n okay give me an element here it is as a form 5 times m 
and given an element in z therefore pi m that's a group element g it acts on x where x is this this is your g this is okay this is going to be n plus pi m okay therefore what is r bit r bit is the equivalence classes that's going to be n plus pi z that again i can write n as as i did earlier q times pi plus r plus pi z therefore this is r plus pi times z plus q but that is same as r times pi z okay etc etc okay therefore what i have shown is even this relation arises out of those two constructions only pause review proceed i am going fast i know okay now what is the quotient topology on z model of this i hope many of you can guess it's a discrete topology why to prove this is a discrete topology what i have to do okay what are the elements of this these are the congruence classes 0 to 1 and 0 and 0 4 so to show is a discrete topology you know if i show each and every element is every singleton is open you understand that so enough to show show where r is equal to yeah but what is pi inverse of singleton r not that is nothing other than r plus pi z just now i showed that is all integers which will leave r as a reminder when divided by pi they are exactly of this form right this is set of all integers that leave r as a reminder as the reminder when divided by by 5 yeah but this is a what is this, this is a subset of z but z has a discrete topology therefore this is open in z see this is open in z this is open in z therefore every singleton is open this means that the quotient topology on is the discrete topology so these are the two examples which are very elementary simple examples one is geometric another one is very familiar because of number theory and group theory that's why i took those two examples there are a lot more non-trivial geometry examples that you have to wait for that when i talk about quotient spaces in depth okay so please go through it it i went a little fast at some places but uh, you have technology at your hand right you can stop me at any time just pause okay click the pause button ask me to stop rewind play it again and learn it okay so please go through all these things in the next lecture i will talk about now that i have constructed new monsters right yeah from x to y one has a space another one does not uh, i equip with the new topology then how do i deal with the new topology space which i constructed okay that about that i am going to give a trade secret and explain it in the next lecture so that will be the last lecture of the series okay Take care, stay safe, we'll meet again.